Hello, this is Ed from practicalnetworking.net. In this video, I'm going to teach you about broadcast. We're going to be doing a comprehensive comparison between local broadcasts and directed broadcasts. Here's the topology we'll be using. Our topology has three routers in the middle that are separating the networks for hosts 1, 2, and 3 on the left from the networks for hosts 4, 5, and 6 on the right. We're going to start with a simple definition of a broadcast. A broadcast is any frame or packet that is destined to everybody on the local network. This is sort of the opposite of what's known as a unicast. Unicast is a frame or packet destined to a single host. And these are both sometimes referred to as one-to-all communication for broadcast or one-to-one -one communication for unicast. In this video, we're going to be focusing on broadcasts. Now notice I said that a broadcast is a frame or a packet, which means there is a layer 2 and a layer 3 implication for what a broadcast is. At layer 2, a broadcast is simply any frame with a layer 2 header that includes a destination MAC address of all Fs. This is a specially reserved MAC address that indicates that this frame should be sent to everybody on the local network. A layer 3 broadcast is the same in that it is simply a specially reserved IP address that you're using as the destination IP address, except at layer 3 we have two different options. Those two options are your local broadcast and your directed broadcast. Now, the term directed broadcast is also sometimes referred to as targeted broadcast. Those are simply two different terms that mean the same thing. Either way, let's take a look at the local broadcast versus the directed broadcast. The local broadcast is the IP address 255.255.255.255. This is a specially reserved IP address that allows any host to send a packet to everybody on the local network. What I mean by that is take a look over here. This is host 1. Host 1 is on the 10.1.1.0/24 network. Host 1 can send a packet to 255.255.255.255 to deliver that packet to host 2, host 3, and the router. Notice the router has an IP address in this network, therefore the router is considered as a member of the local network. Now let me show this to you. This topology that we're looking at is actually something that I've built out in GNS3. So we can use this to test the concepts that we were describing. I'm going to pull up host 1, and I'm going to shoot a ping. Let's minimize this guy. And I'm going to shoot a ping to the local broadcast IP address 255.255.255. This is the ping that I sent, and you'll notice I received four responses. The first response was from host 1's IP address itself. Notice it responded to itself. This response was from host 3, this response was from host 2, and this guy was from host 1. So here we've proven the behavior of the local broadcast. I was able to show you that host 1 can use a local broadcast to send a packet to everybody on the local network. But I want to go a step further and show you what's actually going on in the wire. So let's bring up GNS3 once again, and let's start a ca packet capture on the link between Hub1 and Router1. I'm going to limit the filter to simply display ICMP packets, because that's what we're going to be using for our tests, and I'm going to run the exact same test, because I want to show you this at the wire. Now first, for comparison purposes, I'm going to show you a unicast packet. I'm going to shoot a ping from host 1 to host 3. So this is host 3 right over here. Here's the ping that I sent, and this is the response from host 3. If we go over here to the wire, we can see that this is the echo request. It had a source IP address of host 1's IP address, 1011, and a destination IP address of host 3's IP address, 1011.33. You can see the same thing down here in the layer 3 header. Notice the source of host 1 and a destination of host 3. Here is the layer 2 header. Notice the layer 2 header had a source MAC address of host 1's MAC address and a destination MAC address of host 3's MAC address. This is a unicast packet. Now let's go ahead and test our local broadcast one more time. So I'm going to type ping, and again I'll put in the local broadcast IP address. And once again, we got the same number of responses as before. Host 1, again, the router, host 3, and host 2. But let's take a look at that packet in Wireshark. Here's the ping that host1 sent. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so we can see more information. Notice the ping came from host1's IP address and a destination of the local broadcast, 255.255.255.255. Notice that Wireshark labeled this packet as a broadcast packet because it recognized that this is the local broadcast IP address. If we look at the layer 3 header, that is as expected, host1's IP address to the destination IP address of the local broadcast. 
The layer two header is from a source of host one's MAC address and a destination MAC address of all Fs. Remember, that's the layer two broadcast MAC address. So this packet is both a layer two broadcast and a layer three broadcast. So that is the local broadcast. Now let's talk about the directed broadcast. The directed broadcast is also a specially reserved IP address. It's actually what you know of as the broadcast IP address of every single subnet. This is the 1011.0 slash 24 subnet. And if you do a little bit of subnetting, you can determine that the broadcast IP address for the subnet is 10.1.1.255. Well, host one can use that IP address to send a packet to everybody on this network, just like it did with the local broadcast. And once again, I want to prove this to you. So let's bring up host one and our Wireshark window so we can see what's going on. I'll jump on host one. And just like before, this is us using the local broadcast to speak to every member of the 10.1.1.0/24 network. We're going to see if we get the same results if I shoot a ping to 10.1.1.255. As you can see, we got four responses. Once again, host one responded to itself and also received a response from host the router, host three, and host two. On the wire, some interesting stuff is going on. This is the ping that we sent. Notice the source was host one's IP address and the destination IP address was the directed broadcast IP address, 10.1.1.255. As before, this is echoed in the layer three header and the layer two header has a broadcast MAC address as the layer two destination. Now, if we expand this window, notice before this packet sent to the local broadcast was correctly marked as a broadcast packet. You'll notice Wireshark didn't mark this as the broadcast packet. Well, that's because Wireshark doesn't know that this is a broadcast IP address. You and I know it because we can see the topology map and we know that this network is the slash 24, therefore the dot .255 IP address is the broadcast IP. But Wireshark doesn't know this. If this network was a slash 22, then the dot .255 IP address would be a perfectly valid host IP address. So Wireshark can't simply assume that anything with dot .255 is a broadcast IP. Hence, Wireshark did not label this packet as a broadcast packet, like it did our local broadcast. Moreover, notice this yellow highlighting down here. Wireshark is highlighting this in yellow to give us a warning that they never saw a response to this packet. The reason is this packet was sent to the 255 IP address, so Wireshark is looking for a response from .255. Of course, you and I know that that's not an actual host, that's simply the broadcast IP address. That is why Wireshark marks this packet as no response seen. Here are the actual responses from all the members of the local network, proving that this packet was indeed delivered to everybody on the local network. Now you might notice there are three responses here, but we received four responses from our ping output. That's because this response from host one never actually hit the wire, therefore it wasn't actually captured by Wireshark. Host one simply responded to itself internally. Either way, that proves the behavior of the local broadcast and the directed broadcast. Now, you might be asking yourself, why do we have two different broadcast IP addresses that do the exact same thing? And that's a good question. The answer is that the directed broadcast can actually do something else that the local broadcast cannot. That something else is that the directed broadcast can also be used to send a packet to every host on a foreign IP network. Just like host one was able to use the directed broadcast to send a packet to every member of its own network, it can also use the directed broadcast IP address of a foreign network to speak to every member of a foreign network. Notice here we have the 1033.0 slash 25 network. If we do a little bit of subnetting, we can determine that the broadcast IP address for that subnet is 10.3.3.127, and host one can use that IP address to send a packet to everybody in that network. Now let's go ahead and prove this to you. Now we already have a packet capture running on that interface right there. Before I prove the directed broadcast to speak to a foreign network, I want to go ahead and start a packet capture right there so that you can see what the directed broadcast packet looks like as host one sent it versus as it was delivered by router three. 
So let's go ahead and pull up our GNS3 window again, and we'll start another packet capture right there. I'll move this guy off to the right. And once again, once it finishes loading, I'm going to go ahead and filter this traffic, limit this traffic to only show me ICMP packets. I'll go ahead and pull up host one and the other packet capture window. I'll make this guy a little bit smaller. And let's run some tests. Now, again, I want to start by doing a unicast test. We can use this for comparison purposes to our broadcast in a minute. So I'm going to shoot a ping from host one to host six. So host six IP address is 10.3.3.66. I'll shoot the packet over. Here's a successful response I got from host six. This is what the packet looked like right here. Notice that a source IP address of 10.1.1.11 and a destination IP address of 10.3.3.66. You see the same thing in the layer three header over here. Notice the layer two header had a source MAC address of host one and a destination MAC address of the router. On the other side, we can take a look at the packet as it looks right here between router three and switch two. The layer three information hasn't changed. It still has a source IP address of host one and a destination IP address of host six. The layer three header is going to be consistent and unchanged throughout the entire conversation. But the layer two header is going to be regenerated at every hop in the path. Over here, this layer two header has a source MAC address of router one's NIC right here and a destination MAC address of host six's MAC address right there. Now, this was a unicast packet. Notice we had no broadcast at layer two and no broadcast at layer three. Now let's go ahead and send a packet to the directed broadcast IP address of this subnet over here. So this subnet was a 10.3.3.0 slash 25 network, which makes the directed broadcast IP address 10.3.3.127. I'll shoot the packet over and notice we got four responses. One from router three, one from host six, one from host five, and one from host four. Now, oddly, host three responded with the IP address 10.2.3.3, which is this IP address right here. I would have expected host three to respond from this IP address. I don't know if that's a bug or simply how Cisco's implementation of responding to directed broadcast packets works. Either way, this response is definitely from router three, which is expected because if we look at our topology, we have four members on the 10.3.3.0 network. We've got the router, and then we've got host four, host five, and host six. Now let's take a look at what that packet looked like on the wire. Here is the packet that was sent from host one to the IP address 10.3.3.127. Notice again, Wireshark didn't label that as a broadcast packet, because again, Wireshark doesn't know that this is a broadcast IP address. You and I know because we see the topology map, but Wireshark doesn't, so it can't label it as a broadcast. Moreover, Wireshark is again highlighting this in yellow to indicate that no response was seen. This is because once again, Wireshark is looking for a response from the dot 127 IP address, which you and I know is not a real host. If we look at the layer two source and destination, you'll see it has a source MAC address of host one and a destination MAC address of the router. The interesting thing about this is this is the exact same thing as it was a second ago for our unicast packet. What this should tell you is this packet even though it was sent to a directed broadcast IP address, is a unicast packet. What's happening is when the packet is being sent from host one, it is sent as a unicast packet. From router one to router two, it is forwarded as a unicast packet. Router two to router three, again, forwarded as a unicast packet. But when router three gets it, you're gonna see that router three is going to translate that packet into a broadcast packet so that it can be delivered to everybody on the network. That's what you see right there. This packet is the correlating packet for this packet. This is what the packet looked like right here between hub one and router one. And this is what the packet looked like right here between router three and switch two. Notice over here, the packet had a source IP address of host one and a destination IP address of 255.255.255, the local broadcast IP address. 
router three, knowing that this is a slash 25 network because it's directly attached to that network, knew that this packet was intended to be delivered to everybody on that network and therefore translated this packet into a broadcast packet on this network. This is how it was able to be delivered to host four, host five, and host six. At layer two, we see the destination MAC address of all Fs. Again, this is a broadcast frame. At layer three, again, the same information is echoed, the destination IP address of all 255s. The key takeaway of all this is when host one sent a packet to the directed broadcast IP address of a foreign network, that packet traveled to that foreign network as a unicast packet, where the final router in the path translated it into a broadcast packet to be delivered to everybody on that network. And so that proves the behavior of both the local broadcast and the directed broadcast. To recap, a broadcast is a frame or packet destined to everybody on the local network. At layer two, that frame or packet is going to have a destination IP address of all Fs. At layer three, you've got two options. Those two options are your local broadcast IP address, which is always 255, 255, 255, 255, or the directed broadcast IP address, which is simply the broadcast IP address of each subnet. The local broadcast IP address can be used to speak to everybody on the local network, and the directed broadcast can be used to speak to everybody on the local network or everybody on a forward network. Now, the last thing I want to mention about the directed broadcast has to do with security. At one point in time, everybody trusted each other on the internet. And the idea of allowing somebody to send a packet to everybody on your network was accepted, and then you could trust that the other person wouldn't abuse that. However, in the modern day, we offer zero trust to other members of the internet. Therefore, it's considered a bad security practice to enable directed broadcasts. If you think about it, you don't want somebody else randomly on the internet to be able to send a packet to everybody on your own network. As a result, directed broadcasts are pretty much disabled on all modern operating systems and routers. For this lab to work, I had to explicitly enable directed broadcasts. To enable directed broadcasts on a Cisco router, you'd have to use the command IP directed broadcast. By default on a Cisco router, this is disabled. I had to re-enable it for this lab in order to tell router three to both accept, respond to, and transfer directed broadcast IP addresses into real broadcasts. On the hosts, by default, most hosts will not respond to ICMP echo requests sent to a broadcast IP address. To enable responding to broadcast pings, I had to change the value of this file to zero by default, this file is set to one. I then had to bounce the interface by doing an if down and if up. That's what allowed all these hosts in this lab to respond to broadcast ping requests. I say all this because inevitably, one of you are going to be trying to ping the directed broadcast IP address of a foreign network, and you won't see the same results. That's because by default, directed broadcast is typically disabled on modern routers and modern operating systems. Either way, that wraps up our deep dive into local broadcasts and directed broadcast. Throughout this video, we captured a bunch of packets in Wireshark. If you want to download those packets so that you can study them yourself, go and take a look at the correlating article for this video at practicalnetworking.net. There'll be a link in the description. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.